hello everyone. Uh, my name is Will Falk, and uh, for those of you who I haven't already met, I'm a, a Berto board member, and I do a few other things. Um, I teach at Rotman School of Management, and I'm a fellow at the C.D. Howe, and um, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Michael Miller uh, for a few years now, um, well, actually a bunch of years now, but most recently we re-met um, uh, and uh, I um, became an investor in Verto and then a board member. Um, uh, but I also had the great pleasure to take Michael's course at IHPME, um, which uh, is was a first year course and I'm now taking a, a second year series that uh, he's done on more advanced topics. But the IHPME course was uh, great, though, in terms of uh, uh, giving some skills back to an old guy. And uh, Michael and I have kind of gone back and forth and uh, talked about um, uh, broader learning issues. And we, we'd had this idea to do a Virto based series on kind of current topics in tech that isn't directly related to Virto, but is kind of on the edge of Virto. Um, because Virto's, uh, you know, frankly, one of the best tech teams I've ever worked with. And so they, they've got some great and interesting ideas. Uh, and then when the QR codes uh, came in in Ontario, sorry, have I introduced Michael enough? Michael, have I introduced you enough? Uh, uh, no, you, I've... You, you run Virto, you've got a team of 40, 45, you teach at IHBME. What else yeah. do people need to know about you? There, that's good enough. I'm happy with that. Okay. Um, and uh, Michael is um, uh, someone who I, I listen to a lot on tech issues. So when the QR code uh, thing emerged in Ontario a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I, I called Michael one morning and I said, you know, it feels to me like something may just have changed in Ontario healthcare because not only does every hospital now have a QR code reader, but every restaurant has a QR code reader and every gym has a QR code reader and everyone is used to QR codes and kind of what they are. And I, we started brainstorming what, what kinds of things you could use QR codes for in healthcare. Uh, and it turns out, not surprisingly, that you can use QR codes for quite a lot of things in healthcare. And so long story short, we decided to do QR codes as our first example of what will be a continuing series, kind of five, six, maybe eight times a year of where Virto people, two at a time, talk, maybe three at a time, I shouldn't constrain <laughs> us, yeah. we don't really know yet. Anyway, we're smart, we're smart people in and around Virto talk about tech topics that are related to, or that we're, we're thinking about and that we're working on. So like earlier today, Michael and I were talking about the shit show in Newfoundland. And um, we've had a couple of other ideas for things, and we'll come back to that, that at the end and you know, maybe ask for some advice either on this call or afterwards. Anyway, QR codes have become per pervasive. They can be found everywhere. And so what we're going to do over the next uh, few minutes, and then you can throw some questions on, is, yeah, they're cemented into the, the tech canon, and you can get them really easily in a couple of places. By the way, all the QR codes in this presentation are active uh, and you, you know, you may find, you may or may not find interesting things behind them. Um, but these two in particular, are just the iPhone and the Android uh, uh, pieces, if you want to snap your phone at them. Um, so what Michael's going to do in discussion with me is first he's going to take us through what QR codes are. So next slide, Michael, and a baseline understanding. Then we're going to pause, see if people want to talk or want to chat. And by the way, if you want to chat all the way through, feel free to heckle us uh, or redirect us. 
Then we're going to go into some of the current clinical applications and um, where some of that could go. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about remediation. Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll do that when we do it. And then the final section is we'll talk about future applications. And that will be maybe a little less structured, maybe a little more involvement if you guys have ideas. And we'll talk about where this is going. The, the one thing that I've learned over the last while is that QR codes are already way more sophisticated than I thought they were. I kind of thought they were, you know, 256 characters, have a nice day, maybe a URL. And anyway, Michael, would you tell talk to us a little bit about QR codes and uh, take us through the baseline understanding? Yeah, no problem. So uh, thanks for that introduction. Well, um, yeah, and so uh, our format, we're going to take you through a baseline understanding just of QR codes. And so this is not with a healthcare contest. This is just to understand kind of how the technology works. So what is a QR code and how do they work? So uh, we see them all over the place. You see them on pamphlets. Uh, I actually saw one on the back of a bus. I was very perplexed on how I was supposed to scan that while driving. But, you know, what do they do? And so really they, they're an evolution of what you've seen and known about for a long time, which is the 1D barcodes that you've seen on the UPC labels or when you're scanning anything at a market. But they've actually evolved quite a bit. And the reason why QR codes are so different is because they're generated differently. But I want to talk about how they work. So when you look at a QR code like the one that you have here, there's a five-step process that any technology goes through, right? The first thing that it does is it kind of looks for a safe border around it. So it looks for empty space so it can recognize a QR code. And that's called the quiet zone. Um, it's really important because that this color is still the same as a clear space in the QR code, but it lets you kind of pull out these square objects from everywhere. And that's what your camera does first to look for it. Once it's found this quiet space, then it tries finding the three finder patterns and this orients it. Um, it's very important to talk about why this is important because finding these three squares and the orientation that they have uh, not only does it tell your phone that it's a QR code, but it actually orients it in terms of uh, a plane in three dimensions. And so for other people who want to learn more about it, it gives you three non-collinear points. And the interesting about, thing about that is it lets you actually scan QR codes at non-direct angles. So um, if you want to go around like a little fun test to do is try scanning a QR code from an angle from the side and you're able to do that. And the reason why is because these three points let you figure out that angle. Uh, then the next thing that it does is it uses these little finder, these timing patterns here, and it's a way that it tells and trains your camera on how it can determine what one space is versus another. And it's able to manage that and understand what version of QR code that you have. Once it's done all of that, it then reads the data. It's able to understand the data that you have inside your packet take that data, um, basically use, uh, take out the error correction. Um, and then once it's able to do, uh, take all that data, it then converts it into an action that the QR reader can take. And so most of the time, what you find in these QR codes, especially the ones that are plastered on marketing or hallways, it usually opens a website, it's a URL. So even if you scan a QR code and it jumps you into like, let's say an app store, that's just a URL that redirected you to the app store link that you have. So that's a predominant use in the way that QR codes work in the wild. And so simple use cases, the use cases that you should see most of the time and you can create links to websites. So here's one, actually, if you go inside Google and you click on the address bar, there's a little sign there that actually automatically creates a QR code for any website that you're on. But also you're starting to see them as business cards, right? So now people are walking around, they're touchless business cards. So they work really well, they're easy. You don't have to exchange anything and you're able to move forward really quickly. So go, just go back to Paul, to Paul Martin's one though, because yeah. I love this. Uh, Dr. Martin is, um, is a urologist down in somewhere in Southwestern Ontario. So probably someone on the call knows whether it's London or Windsor, but anyway, he's down South, he's in Southwestern Ontario. And he's got this QR code um, all over his office. 
so that as he's giving explanations, his patients can actually, and this is live, by the way, if you pull this up, you'll go to your Martin Urology and probably Crash's website because I'm sure it hasn't had 22 uh, 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 visitors at the same time um, um, uh, in its history. But anyway, uh, if you go there, he then has educational stuff that he points to. And the, the point is, is just on simple patient education, right? The QR code allows you to digitize that really, really quickly um, and make reference to much wider pieces of things. So your, pa your basic patient education materials not, has nothing to do with the IT department at this point, right? All you're doing is just quickly giving stuff uh, without having to... Um, uh, 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 do more complex. Not that you couldn't give them a URL, just that it's a slicker way of doing it. Yeah, and uh, as, <laughs> as I was going through and making this presentation, uh, I guess it dates myself also, but I remember those big brochure trays that you had in every clinic, right? Where they gave you cell pulse or anything. Um, and I actually noticed in a clinic that it was completely replaced with like QR codes and like, links or sign up with this newsletter. So it was very interesting to see. Well, and um, why you wouldn't, why wouldn't you do that, right? Yeah, I mean, since everyone already knows how to do this in restaurants to be able to order drinks, you may as well do it, right? Now, yeah. now you got to tell me though, what's this? Because this is, this looks like a QR code. <laughs> um, the back of the, my OIP card, by the way, guys. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's a great question. So um, it actually is one of the important evolutions of the barcode as we got to a QR code. And so one of the things is that um, barcodes, you know, we've, we've had these 1D barcodes for ages and ages and they've been on scanning devices, like I, I think as early as 1980s, 1970s even. And so what happens is that people wanted to evolve on it. So, but people use barcodes in different ways. And so the, what you see on the back of your OHIP card is actually what they call PDF 417 format. And it was designed because people didn't like the limited data that 1D barcode could hold. So, they say, wait, so, so, so how, many, how much data did a QR code used to be able to have and how much can it have today? Oh, like since the very beginning? Oh man, I, I just, you literally asked me that question. But at the very beginning, I think it was, it was as little as, as you said, 256 byte uh, bits of data. So it was very few characters, divide that by eight. Um, but then, so the original QR code only had that amount, but it's actually- 32. Evolved. 32, yeah. Uh, uh, remember, yeah, 32 remember, two, four, eight, 16, 13, <laughs> yeah, yeah, four, yeah. 128. Yeah, okay, keep going. Um, but yeah, so- So how many today? So wait, um, how many today? It can go up to around about 7,000 characters, I believe. Um, that's but 7,000 isn't a multiple of two. Why is, why is it 7,000? Um, because oh, it's, data loss. it's the data loss on the three little squares. Yeah, it's error correction. It's uh, data loss on the clusters as well as er error correction. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later on. So 8,192 <laughs> minus about 1,000 for error correction. Okay. And so what was the, what, why did they do PDF 417? That's like on the back of my airplane tickets too, right? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, definitely. I've seen it on airplane tickets. I've seen it on the OHIP card. I've seen it on some other identifiers. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen it on packing slips also. And so usually when they you see a PDF 417, it's because they're trying to take data. They're trying to codify data in a digital readable format, but it's high density. So this is um, before the, the newest version of QR code was out, when they wanted to put in closer to 4K, petabytes of data, PDF 417 is only where you could go. So that's the reason why, but it was high data cap capacity. The problem is typical scanners can't scan it. Um, you need to orient the camera and the reader in the proper way. And so one of the things that you'll notice, even if you have a scanner and you look at a PDF 417, you kind of have to hold it over the scanner for a while before it reads it. And so that's why other people wanted to evolve it. So if you look at the data matrix, this is for people who wanted to put data in smaller sections of, of a code. 
Then you also have this uh, matrix maxi code and maxi code was designed for high speed conveyor scanning. And so what you saw was that the 1D barcode evolved in specific ways based on the purpose. But then uh, it's actually interesting because in, in preparing this deck, I learned a lot more, but it was actually a Japanese company. Um, I forget which one it was. I got to look it up. That it's, it's on the wiki page and you can look at everything. But they said, I want everything. I want higher data. I want to read it at different angles and I want fast speed scanning. And that's actually what created the evolution of the QR code. And it kind of brings together the high density. So QR codes can store more data than a PDF 14, 417. Um, and it's able to be uh, used at high speed at different angles and it uses a small footprint. And this is kind of his. And so I actually put the two sources that I got this from as QR codes in the bottom. So you're free to scan them if you want. Uh, so there's a, I, I downloaded the, um, the PDF 417 reader. The one I found was called um, Blink. And, and I'm looking at my OHIP card now. And... I can't get it to work. <laughs> you got to scan it horizontally. This is actually the exact reason why they moved away from PDF 417. So what's on my OHIP card? What's on my OHIP card? Um, on your OHIP card, you actually have uh, sure. a, co a combination of, you have all the data that you see on the front of the card, actually. And it, it's not delimited. It's just yeah. in character patterns at the very beginning. But then after that, yeah. you have a, a signed portion that's encrypted that contains additional health information of, about you. But in order to decrypt that, you need to have access to the, the public key, which we'll talk a little bit later on. But Kingston put something on the back of the OHIP card using, P, using PDF 417 with some encrypted stuff. Yeah, they actually put in more information that you can read from the medic stripe and all the information that you can read on the front of the card. That's uh, actually just plain text readable at this point. But despite the QR code actually bringing all these technologies together, one of the biggest reasons why it actually got adopted and why it is pervasive now is actually because they're resilient. Um, one of the biggest things that er people don't know about er uh, QR codes is that you can actually set the setting on how resilient and how much error correction that you want. But you can have seven to 30% data loss based on the way that you've actually uh, codified the QR code. And so I put a coffee stain on top of this QR code, but you should still be able to scan it because the system's able to recover. Let me, let me test my own theory here. Yeah, I'm able to, it's a link to my our website and it still works even though a large part of the code is obscured. So if you did and, something, and it's just it's just purely a fluke that your coffee stain looks like the language in the movie Arrival from 2016, because because uh, that, that was like QR codes for aliens, right? Um, yes. So no, unfortunately, I don't speak that language like you do, Will. So um, I'm sure that this okay. this coffee stain is more meaningful. <laughs> but yeah, the whole thing is. You know, this is why it kind of worked, right? Because the reason why it's pervasive is because it survives. Uh, restaurants can simply ask their their favorite uh, technology savvy sibling or, or child to print off a QR code, stamp it up, and now you have touchless menus for every single restaurant. And so, what you're able to do with that is now now you've got it. Now it's at the point, as you mentioned before, Apple has it built into the camera. Android has it built into the camera. It, you know, I remember the day when I had to scrounge just for an app that would allow me to allow me to look at QR codes and render them. But that that's now just part of the canon. Okay. So um, let's go, let's move forward to the um, clinical applications because once you've got that, uh, other than just basic information sharing, where do you, what, what do you see people doing with it? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's a, it was kind of interesting to go around and understand um, how, because you see it, like it's pervasive in 
regular society now. You go to a restaurant, you see it. Um, every marketing board has it. Um, I, I, I also like seeing QR codes used in situations where it's impossible to actually leverage them, but they're all around. So it was interesting to go back into healthcare and understand. And one of the things I first realized is that a lot of healthcare, if you go to the physical areas, they haven't changed yet. And that's probably because they're still actually fairly virtual. But I was able to gather four kind of modes I've seen it being used a little bit more in healthcare. And so the first one that's obvious is vaccine passports. So I'm going to go over that really quickly here. And so um, I looked into the, the Ontario uh, vaccine passport, which inevitably led me to the Quebec passport. But it was interesting because if you take a QR code and scan your vaccine certificate, you'll notice that it's prepended with an SHC colon slash. So if you, if you just take any QR code reader and you look at it, you'll notice that it's done that way. And so when you look into that, you realize that that's actually the smart health card standard. And so if people aren't familiar with it, smart is smart on fire, might be something that you've heard of before. And it's a whole app access uh, methodology uh, based out of the uh, team out in Boston who, who created the, the smart framework. And it's used to access fire HL7 records, but it was they used a smart health card format that's long been published actually to support these vaccine uh, passports. Um, the reason why that's so powerful is because they developed it with security in mind. And so uh, these vaccine passports, they actually create a JSON, a JSON object. So anyone who's technical, it's just a structure of how data is organized. Here's, uh, I took a screenshot of the actual JSON. Um, there's actually a, a guy, Mikkel, like I went over to his blog, a very excellent analysis on how the vaccine passport was done. The QR code jumps you to that site as well. But what happens is that the information's in there, but it's actually cryptographically signed by the issuer. And so the reason why this is so important is because they're actually able to take your vaccine information and they were able to encrypt it using a key that only they know. And what they've done to let vaccine passports work, and the reason why any person, any company can download the Vaccine Ontario app is because the only thing that's in the app is actually the public key that decrypts that JSON code, right? And so the nice thing about it is that they can hide this data in plain sight. This is a reason why you can have a QR code, but someone can't steal that QR code from you because the data inside it is encrypted and when it gets decrypted, it will always have the same information, which is your first name and date of birth. And one thing that's really actually neat about the way that this smart health card was made was that it doesn't actually just say, yes, you're vaccinated and give you a check mark. It actually codifies the dose that you had. So the cool thing about that is in the future, if we have multiple doses and the standard changes, you can actually use the exact same QR code reader because it's just unpacking the data that exists inside that large QR code. Pretty impressive. Uh, I, I assume that also means that using the same standard, you can put 7K of stuff in there, again, with data, with data loss for other reasons. Um, uh, but, but, but even allowing for that, that's, uh, that's a fair amount of data, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and it, the, the nice thing about it is that this is encrypted, error correcting data that you can walk around with, right? So it really kind of changes your concept of what is physical and what is digital. And so it's really interesting. And I got to commend, I mean, like uh, great use of the great job on the smart uh, health card format and kudos to the provinces for using that. And, you know, even the Ontario Verify Ontario app is actually on GitHub. It's open source. I'm going to remember to bring that up next time I'm in negotiation about open source. But um, yeah, so vaccine <laughs> passport. <laughs> yeah, vaccine keep going. Yeah, okay. So let's look at some of the other ones. So this is what you brought up before, which is this uh, PDF 417 format on the back of the health card. And so what does this mean? And so a lot of clinics already use a magnetic stripe. That's totally fine. But magnetic stripes actually contain a similar amount of information to what you'd expect in a 1D barcode, right? So if you look at the front of a card, oh, go ahead. 
Yeah. Uh, if you look at the front of the card, you have the health card number, version, you have the date of birth, expiry. There's a lot of information there. And so with the 417 standard, they're actually able to put that data on the back. And the neat thing about the OHIPA card is some of it's in plain text. So if you're able to find an efficient optical scanner, yeah, that, that's the only barrier, as you saw before. Like if you try scanning the PDF 417s, it takes a, probably one or two seconds before an optical scanner can read it. So that's one of the disadvantages. But one of the things it enables is it's touchless, right? The number of times I've used a magnetic stripe and ended up having to touch something in order to validate it is a little infuriating. But the PDF 417 actually allows you to do this. And so one of the things that you can extrapolate for them as, as well is that we could actually send QR codes out with things like um, appointments or actually use QR codes as identities as well. And so it's just an interesting thing that we can consider about because there's an infection control benefit that you get as well. Um, and then there's the most common one that everyone should start seeing. Um, I went, uh, unfortunately I had to go to a hospital uh, a month ago, but I was absolutely shocked with just how, when I was going down the hallway, how everything had a QR code on it. It was designed, just all the information, all the education. There was a patient experience survey that I could scan a QR code for, but you're gonna start seeing that a lot of people are gonna replace their brochure tables. They're going to uh, plaster waiting room areas with this QR codes. And um, I, you know, personally, like you saw in restaurants, right? like technically restaurants turned into clinics because you had to do your COVID screener. And so not only was the QR the code for the menu there, but the QR code for the screener app was there as well. And so uh, you can thank restaurants for training us uh, on how to create a more infectious control aware and more streamlined healthcare clinic setting. But you should expect that from now on, when you fill out patient registration forms, it's likely going to be on your personal device going forward. And it brings us to kind of the last application that we've started seeing a lot more. And so, um, you know, if you've worked in a hospital, everyone knows the hospital records department. Um, you can have a form, then you have to print off the little form ID plaster on the top and it's just a barcode. Um, now that QR codes can store more information, it actually completely changes the paradigm. So now if you're printing off information from a computer, you could also print off a QR code that keeps all that digital information intact in the QR code by itself. And so this can have significant impacts for requisitions printed off from EMRs, prescriptions printed off from EMRs. And you know, some EMR vendors have already gone forward with this. If you look at the Oscar team, they've actually put in a QR code library to support this ability to store this data. Um, but so what this means is, is what this means, Michael, is is that you can skip the reentry, the data reentry step, because you can actually pick the information up off of the QR code, even though you've been given it on paper. Yeah, am I saying that? Oh, you're totally saying, that. and that's that's for static QR codes. That's where the data is in the QR code. Not okay. only are you uh, removing what is probably the bane of many a, an administrator's day, you're also removing type or copy paste errors, right? Or, or the ability for them to more accurately take that information and bring it into their new system. But there's another evolution of this that we're starting to see, which is the concept of a dynamic QR code link. And so you can also put a dynamic QR code link on these requisitions. And what that does is it now lets you track that form as it goes through its journey. So now when you arrive at a new ah. specialist clinic, it, it basically links to a website, which lets the originating provider know that you have actually now given this form to a third party. And so, so like an opioid, an opioid script. <laughs> yeah. For yeah, example. Yeah, for or, sure. Or, but does that mean that I can do an e-referral without knowing which orthopod I'm sending the patient to? Yeah, the, yeah it, it means that you can really change the nature of these documents. You can give them a life beyond the paper that they're printed on. 
And so, yeah, yeah the concept is, um, you know, there's a lot of issues regarding, well, you talked about it, opioids. The whole point is how can you make sure a prescription isn't given to different people? You can either try integrating everyone behind the scenes or just add a live token that only is valid one time. But um, so what, already... is, what is a token? What is a token? No. When you say when you say you put a token, what does that mean? What, 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 what is a token and who controls it? Yeah, so that's um, uh, I actually I allude to that a little bit in our future applications. And so okay, the, I'm, I'll, I'll let you do that. No, no, okay. no, no. The conversation is, is bringing us there anyways, because that's the reason why I put clinical document 3.0 into that section, because just to reinforce, clinical document one was just a paper form with a carbon copy. Version two was the scanner code that hospital records love. But really, we have a chance of moving it into a different realm. And so, yeah, this kind of brings us into our last session, section, which is just to talk about what this means, right? To really let our minds go a little bit crazy with it. And so, I explain what. Uh, and and let's just. Check. Let's just check for a second and see yeah. if anyone wants to throw any questions in the chat as we go here. I'll monitor the chat while you talk and you talk about uh, disrupting on interoperability. But if people have questions, you can throw them into the chat and, and we'll try to answer them. Go ahead, Michael. Okay. I'm just going to jump into the next one because it, it kind of dovetails into your question, which is around yeah. what a token is. And so, um, there, a token could be simple. It could just be some type of uh, code that only you know that you put into the wild. It means nothing to another person, but it means everything to our application. So for example, uh, we could say, okay, for this, appoint this referral has this random number that no one could randomly create. And that's how we link to it, right? But there's different ways that you can hack these tokens. There's different ways that you can fool around with them. And so you need to create a standard that is used to putting something that demonstrates a trust or a session. And this is what a token is. A token is something that you create, that you can give to someone that they can hold and it means nothing. The data that they hold means nothing. But if they were to provide that to you back again, it gives you an understanding of who they were. It gives you an understanding of who created that token. And so the, the concept of it, it's like a secure way of transporting data without the person who transporting it being able to unpack and understand the data inside it. And so one of the most common types of tokens that's out there, and it's a one that's used for the vaccine passports is what they call a JSON web token, a JWT. And so one of the things that's really crazy about a JWT is you can put any data inside it, right? So one of the crazy ways that it's something as simple as a QR code can completely disrupt a problem in healthcare, such as interoperability, is because I can take a, a data that's important to me. So let's say I meet a patient and I'm giving them, and I actually love your opioid example. So let's say that I'm, I'm a physician, someone comes to me, I know their, their medication profile, and I know that prescribing an opioid is the right thing to do. I have to go through all my checks and everything. But in this world, I as a physician say, me as a physician and this, uh, this patient, I give this opioid with this many doses and no refills. And I put that in a web token and I encrypt it and I give it to the patient. And I can say, hey patient, go anywhere. You can go to any pharmacy that you want to. And what they can do is no matter how much that patient wants to open up, they can't, it's encrypted. It's, it's signed and it's only something that I can give. And when they bring it to another person, what we can do is not only are they able to open that up and make sure that only the pharmacist sees that, but if that web token or if that, that QR code is linked to a call back to my EMR, then as soon as the pharmacist serves that order, then it could notify me or prescribe it or any kind of central system to say that that request has, or that prescription so, has been so, so you can give someone a prescription, but then turn it off remotely? Yes. Could you disable the QR code if you changed your mind later? Yeah, because what you can do is give that token a specific ID 
that you always actively manage? Okay, there was a good question in the in the Q and A part, um, and I think there might be another one coming. There was a good question in the Q and A part about um, that I've answered. But how? What about people who don't have access to smartphones? And so I gave um, I gave the answer that it's a good question, uh, but it's also I think part of the point about QR codes because. One of the things about QR codes is you can give a digital, you can give something that will be digital that's on a piece of paper along with the thing you're already giving. So it's a prescription, it's a lab test, whatever. And a daughter or a, uh, uh, a parent can then take that and turn it into something, someone who does have a smartphone. So one of the great things I love about this QR code idea is actually that it expands access. So my mom is blind and I'm her uh, essential caregiver. They, people can't give her things digitally, but they often give her pieces of paper. If someone gave her a piece of paper, and I was then given the piece of paper, I could then upload it digitally. So, and I'm sorry, it's an anonymous attendee. So I hope I answered your question. And I'm gonna go to the other open question. How about a hospital where there is limited phone service? Um, again, I think it's the same answer, right? Wow. That, that in fact, the QR code gives you redundancy on the, um, on the uh, on it, am I right, Michael? Maybe I should let you have a chance to answer. No, that. no, it's completely right. Actually, that's one of the one of the beauties about uh, the QR code is uh, you know, and I and I explain it in my class. I say we have the real world. Everyone knows the real world, but technologists understand the digital world. And the hard thing is, analog things have a trouble existing in the, di the digital world correctly, and digital things have trouble existing in the analog world. But a QR code is a digital piece of data that works in the real world. And so it's exactly how Will talked about, when you have limited phone service, if you have bad reception, if you print off that QR code, remember, there's two types of QR codes. Uh, there's a static QR code where all the data is in the actual QR code itself. And then there's what they call dynamic QR codes, which point to a website. So they kind of link you to a central thing. So in situations where you have bad internet connectivity, you should use static QR code technology. And that's actually what they did with the vaccine passport. Oh, that's, that's right. Oh, so the, the point is, is that had you done a live thing on your phone, that would have required connectivity, but the QR code doesn't require any connectivity, so you can do it. Exactly. Um, so static QR codes are the way to solve the connectivity issue. So Arsenius, uh, Andrew Arsenius is making a point in the chat that, uh, as and he's a, I know, um, uh, he's a pharmacist who I know, um, that, um, that there's, that, that there's a deprescribing thing that could go on here. Have you thought about deprescribing at all? Yeah, so. Because <laughs> that's, that's there's this absurd fax chasing that goes on. No, for sure. I imagine, imagine if you were effective at, at, at tracking all active prescriptions in an easy way and you had the central repository. Yes, you can deprescribe. You could do med reconciliation in a, in a group model. There's many interesting things that you can do with it. But the important thing is, uh, and I just want to build on the, the, the first question, which is what about people who do not have access to smartphones? The great thing is they don't have to. They can have six pieces of paper and they're just as digitally connected as a person with a smartphone, which I absolutely love. And so the, the concept here is, and then it actually goes one step further, um, which is now, you know, one of the things that we always forget when we talk about our forms and their connectivity, as people who read English with good vision and health literacy, we're fine with our forms. But what about people who don't speak it as a first language? What about the visually impaired? Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Which side is control of what language you see on? Is it on the printer side or on the recipient side or is it shared? Well, uh, oh, 
um, when you uh, when you print the QR code, if it's a dynamic link, what I'm saying is that right now you only can print one language. But if oh. you print a QR code, then you, and it's a dynamic link, and let's say that I have an account or my phone preference is default set to um, Spanish or French, when I scan the QR code, it can actually interpret that same digital entity in my language. Or for the visually impaired, it can put it on a device that helps them understand it without actually being able to see it directly. Okay, Jeff Cameron is asking a set of questions that I'm not sure I fully understand yeah. um, because he's smarter than I am. Um, do you need the app locally to decrypt? Um, do you need the app? You need, so, the, pu you need the public key locally yeah. to decrypt. So, so, so take a look at the chat, Michael, because he, he, he said, he, he started out by saying static cannot really be encrypted. I think that's right. To get dynamic, you'd have to get back to connectivity. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes. So static keys can support it without connectivity. And this is actually one of the reasons why you'll notice on the Verify Ontario app, when you load it, you have to be connected to the internet. But once you've loaded it, you can actually run it without an actual internet connection because it's already downloaded the public key. So a lot of ways that people get around this is that they just embed the public key in the app, um, which again, if you're a good coder, you know it's not the best practice, but it's a way to get out of that uh, reception zone issue that you have. Okay, do you have more future applications you want to introduce? Yeah, uh, for sure. Oh. Um, so yes, thanks, so I've been, yeah. Yeah, so um, actually one of the other ones I was thinking about, and, and remember, these are just brainstorms. This was just like, I was thinking, wow, could this change it, is disposable two-factor authentication, right? So one of the biggest things that we have, you know, I, I keep on thinking about it and I'm like, wow, username and password going into a patient portal, there's gotta be a better way to make it so that we can access information. And it doesn't really, you know, all that's happening is that um, patients who require caregivers are just giving the, the, the access to their caregiver. So we're just tricking ourselves that we're actually empowering this. And so, you know, if when you send out a appointment request or when you send out a referral, if you, these are all things you have, they are all things that are being given to you. And so now we, we can use QR codes to create this dynamic trail of things that a patient should have. Right. And so now, you know, if you want someone to give you service, well, you could be on a virtual call. And if you want to confirm identity, you could just wave a QR code. Okay. Yeah. I gave that to you within 24 hours. Let's just talk. And so these weird rules about you're not able to pick up a phone or you're not able to, you know, how do you validate uh, identity? Oh, perfect. And perfect. I got to tell you, like I just did a flu shot at my local pharmacy. I was on a wait list. I got a clunky note because they, they don't have a terribly great app. Um, I got a clunky note. And because I was within 24 hours of my appointment, I then had to verify my clunky note appointment. So I'm going to say I entered 25 different fields, about 10 of which my phone helped me with, which was great. And then I had to re-enter more fields again um, that I had already entered because I got a second text message verifying. Um, and the whole thing is just like, blah, right? Um, so that kind of thing can just go away because yeah. I, I, okay. Um, yeah. And that's, it's basically meeting the patients where they're at, right? In terms of, you know, they're not used to using SMS, they're used to using email. And so really, if you're giving a username and password, you're just kind of trapping them into another situation where it's a health equity and a digital literacy kind of issue again. And then the last kind of topic that I was thinking about, and this is one thing people forget about the uh, QR codes, when they first came out and they're super hot, 2008 or something like that, I remember seeing the first time I saw a QR code, it was augmented reality. And so whenever you see a QR code, because of those three points, those three finder markings, it actually can orient the QR code relative to everything. And then what I said is like, okay, you've got all these hospitals that don't have beacons in them. You can actually just paste these QR codes on the wall. 
and actually give the ability for them to deal with the technology limitation with a very on the cheap kind of way of managing it. And lo and behold, if you got, you know, everyone likes Boston Dynamics or that robotic shop that makes those little dogs that, or those crazy robots that jump around, they actually have practical use cases of it in like a, a German dam. And all they did was stick QR codes on the wall. And now these robots were able to uh, walk around and understand where they're at. But um, it really made me realize that here's an opportunity, right? A lot of people try using Wi-Fi localization. It doesn't work out. You can use QR codes for spatial orientation as well. So there's another, um, uh, another anonymous question about the username password point you make, you made that I promoted. Um, uh, but I think, I think I know what the answer is, given what you just said. You were talking about two-factor authentication. And your point is, is that the QR code could function as a disposable two-factor authentication. So for the, pa for the patient who had a collection of, uh, let's make up a mythical chronic patient who didn't have a lot of technology literacy, but had five or six different portals that they wanted to get into. There's no reason why they couldn't have a separate piece of paper for each portal, right? That would allow them to get to, to more quickly get in and out or well, that's probably a stretch. <laughs> yeah, so actually one of the big problems when it comes to security is uh, uh, once you give something to someone, to, to, as a second identifier. So let's say a password or something. As time goes on, the likelihood that that is private and secure diminishes over time, right? And so one of the things that's kind of cool about the QR codes and the tokens is you can just keep on creating tokens that are only valid to an event. So let's say you have an appointment at a hospital. If I say, if I give you a QR code and I say, here you go, I sent it to your email. If you use this QR code, it's valid up to your appointment that's just in a week. It's actually more secure to give that to them as a way for them to quickly access a portal than it is to ask them to create a username and password. Because if they create a username and password, they're going to save it in their email or in a post-it note. Or I, 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 I know exactly which password I'm using for that because I have a password that I always use for that. Yeah, right. And so the thing is, is that if you can actually create these one-time access tokens, that are relevant to a continually engaging model. So every prescription, every appointment, every visit, every follow-up that you have, that you have these time-based tokens that are just valid for that short period, you actually have more assurance that the right person's logging into the system. And you actually, you actually significantly decrease the concept of a population-based infringement into secure access. And so it's an interesting concept where rapidly churning services are actually more secure than second factor authentication that could be lost or copied. So I think we've had QR codes live since October 22nd and that we're already seeing a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know if anyone on the call uh, wants to bring anything else to our attention that they've seen recently, but I'm pretty convinced and you've convinced me more, Michael, that this is going to become uh, ubiquitous in healthcare and as a way of remediating some of these slow to move digital services, personally, I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, it, it, it gives you a way of disconnecting the fax machine, I think. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that one, that, that's a good target for this one. And the funny thing is, you can actually send a QR code over the fax to get rid of the fax. So that would be an interesting way. Well, one getting... page faxes, right? Yeah. <laughs> you could do one page faxes and then digitally upload the information. I yeah. mean, okay, so 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 maybe guys, that's not perfect. Uh, but but you know, if you're treating the fax as a secure link already, which you know, God bless you for doing it. Um, <laughs> but if you're doing that and you're sending a 40 page fax, why not send a one-time secure digital token uh, on one page that the person then can upload and, and pull across? I mean, yeah. at least then we take the fax volume down. You know, would you prefer to have me send the 40 page fax or a QR code? 
you could ask that. Um, the nice, the other nice thing is, is I suppose you could have a, well, let me ask, can you have a simple, broad identification that someone is in healthcare? A simple, broad identification. Like, like a role-based identification that yes, this is a healthcare institution. Oh, um, as a QR code? No, as a recipient of a QR code. Could you put could you put a simple key out there that everyone? Hundred uh, percent. Okay. Yes. So 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 that would at least solve the situation where you send a record to the to Joe's Trucking Service by mistake. Yeah. Joe's and- Trucking Service wouldn't be able to read the QR code. No, they wouldn't. And so that's where that's really goes back to the disrupting and interoperability concept, which is right. if you say a dynamic link to another provider, then I can use all the normal security controls that I normally use um, to l- determine if a clinician can access something or right. if this type of provider can use it when I serve back that link. So the funny thing is you can even make a link where someone thinks that they have access to data, but it's only public data that you're sharing with them. But if a provider was to click on the or use the exact same QR code link, suddenly it, it transfers over a full longitudinal record, rationale for prescription, and the referral at the exact same time. And this is where the, this whole concept, like one of the things that made interoperability so hard was that you had to push everything. Everything was about pushing, pushing into a repository, pushing it somewhere. QR codes can change that entire model into pull, which is way more elegant, way more lighter, and way more configurable for the types of people who are accessing the data. Wow. So, so Michael, let's close off. We've got four minutes. Um, we've done questions. Um, Virto Health, uh, this is the paid political announcement, by the way, for anyone who wants to go now, you can go if you already know what Virto is. Uh, Otherwise, you can click the QR code and you can learn about Virto. Actually, sorry, I I went to paid political announcement first. We're going to do a bunch more of these. And here are our possible topics. Is that right? Yeah. So what are our possible topics? And do people have other topics they want? Yeah. So there, here's a few, like we're just thinking there's been a lot of ransomware in healthcare. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about why healthcare is so especially delicious as a target for hackers and letting them understand it. Um, we're talking about how cloud technology has really changed what the developer paradigm is. And we want to talk a little bit about more about how you, how you have to hire for that, how a lot of, you know, it's good techniques in this very competitive market to identify the people that you need for your next evolution. Um, Omnichannel engagement, why, you know, we need to understand why patient centricity is a kind of frowned upon word. So these are just different topics we were thinking about. You you, you know, your your Ninja Ops series, Michael, I mean, that one you did recently with, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name, the uh, GitHub one. Yeah, Maria. Yeah, that was amazing. So um, uh, the, the, the GitHub one, I think we should do as well, um, because, because I for sure had, I don't know, maybe that's not news to other people, but that it was news to me, um, you know, having last been, uh, thank you, Aaron, um, having last been a programmer in the 80s, uh, it was news to me. Um, so that kind of thing. I, if there are other ideas that people have, if you want to send Michael or me a note, that would be great. And uh, otherwise, the last two slides are the paid political announcement, um, and they'll be in <laughs> well, the next, which we're going to post, right? For sure. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, I won't subject you, but you know, everyone here, thank you for your questions. Thanks for staying and learning a little bit about, more about QR codes. Uh, we're going to follow this up with a video so you can share or refer to it if you have any other questions. But yeah, if you have any other thoughts, we'd we'll love to talk about it. The, um, we're going to keep this as apolitical as possible. I just like sharing some information about how technology can really kind of help us unlock the next phase of healthcare. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.